Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of our evaluation of GI bleeding. We left off last time as we were going to speak about the colon. We had spoken about the stomach. We spoke about the small bowel. And now let's take a look at the colon. Causes of GI bleeding, no surprises. Inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, colon cancer, radiation or chemotherapy-induced complications, and trauma oral possibilities. The most common thing we deal with in practice really is inflammatory disease, typically diverticular disease or diverticulitis. Now let's look at a few different things. Angiodysplasia. We mentioned that angiodysplasia is the number one cause of small bowel bleeding. It accounts for about 6% of lower GI bleeding. We talked about this abnormal proliferation of venules and capillaries in the submucosal layer of bowel. It's more common in aging. 75% of the cases are in the right colon. And colonoscopy is not sensitive for this diagnosis. Um, it barely detects two-thirds of cases that are seen on angiography. And CT is very good for looking at angiodysplasia. Densely opacified and dilated draining veins early filling veins or dilated feeding arteries, vascular submucosal tufts in the wall of the colon are all things we need to look for. Arterial phase images are key, with venous phase imaging typically being less important, but still important. If you look very carefully here at the patient's right colon, at first you notice some thickening, but then there's some prominent vessels. But Remember, we speak about going beyond the axial plane. And when you look at it at volume rendering on the left, MIP on the right, you can see the very prominent vessels from the iliocolic branching, really prominent vessels. That is the look of angiodysplasia of the cecum and right colon. You could see it very nicely on these images as well. This is angiodysplasia. On the axial images, there was a bright blush, so you need to suspect Maybe there's inflammatory disease going on. Maybe if you look carefully, make sure there's no malignancy. But when you go to the MIP or the volume rendering, and I always do both, but MIP especially can be valuable in looking at angiodysplasia, very nicely shown on these targeted images. And again, here's just a few more looks because I really want you to know what a classic case of angiodysplasia looks like. While diverticulosis is the most common cause of lower GI bleeding, angioectasia is the most common vascular lesion causing lower GI bleeding, and again, it's an older population. So you're not going to see angiodysplasia in a 30-year-old, but more commonly in a 70- or 80-year-old. And again, think about right colon, just like the past case. It was the cecum and ascending colon. So the case I just showed you really really, really is the most classic of appearances. Now, with, what about diverticular disease? Up to 15% of patients with diverticular disease will bleed at some point in their life. Bleeding is usually painless and large, and in up to one-third of cases requires hemorrhage and hospitalization. But the, re, the flip of that is the fact once the initial episode of bleeding stops, most patients will not recur, and only 30% of patients will present a second time with bleeding. It's this rebleeding group where the risk of a new bleeding episode is high, and that's where surgical intervention or embolization or some procedure is recommended. Most patients, at the first time bleeding, the bleeding will stop, and a more conservative approach is going to be valuable. Now, just like I showed you with the patient's um, uh, small bowel and stomach. Arterial phase is good. You can see this high density here. Again, you're not really going to worry that uh, that's foreign matter, but you can think about it. What is that? We'll look at it more carefully. There it is as you go on to the coronal, as you'll see in a moment, but here it's simply going from arterial to venous. And yes, there's something here you should be able to call, but here's my point. Look how much more obvious it is. Look how much more extensive it is. This is why venous imaging on top of arterial imaging for GI bleeding is so important. Here's the same patient on the volume rendered coronal view, arterial and venous. Here there's a little bit. Here it's very, very obvious. 
the act of bleeding. Another case, this patient has GI bleeding. You see on the coronal view, the side of active bleeding in the descending colon. That's the classic look of a bleed due to diverticular disease. As you go from arterial to venous, the act of bleeding, which is shown easily diagnosed arterial, is shown better on the venous phase imaging. You can see it's more extensive. The shape changes. Again, an easy diagnosis. And in this case, the patient was bleeding a lot. And with the arterial to venous being so active, this patient went on to angiography. Angio, which was done two hours later, which is, you know, the typical numbers, there was no active bleeding at that time. So again, very nice example of showing you the difference between arterial and venous phase imaging and why most of these patients can be managed conservatively. Angiography, just because the CT is positive, does not mean angiography is going to be positive two to four hours later. Now, this was an oncology patient on immunotherapy, and the patient had bleeding. And when you look carefully, you can see there's a source of bleeding in the sigmoid colon. And in fact, when you look harder, there are multiple sites of bleeding present. You could think of something like angiodysplasia, I guess, but there's multiple areas of bleeding present. And as you continue to look, not only is there bleeding in the patient's sigmoid colon, but is this bleeding also in the patient's cecum. Now, diverticular disease, this doesn't look like it, but it's not going to be bleeding in the right and left colon. Uh, angiodysplasia, usually it's a solitary lesion, more common in the right colon than the left. And this patient wasn't very old. When you start seeing multiple sites of bleeding, you got to think about what else could be going on. I guess theoretically anticoagulant therapy, but that rarely causes GI bleeding, two sites at the same time. But if you're on immunotherapy, this can be one of the things to think about. And you can see as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, how extensive the bleeding is in the junction of descending colon and sigmoid colon. You see it very nicely on the volume imaging. You can see it very nicely on the MIP imaging. And the MIP imaging also nicely shows you the uh, cecal bleeding. This case also tells you and teaches you that if you see a site of bleeding, make sure there's not a second site. Yes, it's rare, but it does occur. And particularly if the patients are on chemotherapy or immunotherapy, it's something you need to think about. This, poison, this patient was on checkpoint inhibitors, and that was the... Uh, colitis from checkpoint inhibitors, CPI, with active bleeding in multiple sites. Immune-related enterocolitis is the most common serious complication from checkpoint inhibitors. The current frontline treatment for a range of tumors, uh, high-dose corticosteroids can be used to treat them, but they have side effects. And again, one of the things to think about in patients who are immunotherapy or any chemotherapy is always going to be active GI bleeding. CI, CT angiography performed the emergency setting in patients with acute lower intestinal bleeding is feasible and correctly depicts, depicts the presence and location of active or recent hemorrhage, as well as the potential causes of the majority of patients. This was an important article when it was written nearly 12 years ago, showing that when done correctly, CT had an accuracy in the high 90% range. Now, an area of common bleeding and one you need to look at carefully and why the techs need to scan down a little bit lower routinely on, um, on routine abdomen studies, but solely GI bleeding studies, is because rectal bleeding is a common pathology. It could be due to angiodysplasia, rectal AVMs, patients with cirrhosis can have rectal varices, can be due to diverticular disease or stercoral colitis can be due to radiation or ischemia or infectious etiologies. Here's a nice example. Patient had ulcerative colitis. Look how bright the enhancement of the rectum is. And when you look at the sagittal views, look at how bright the uh, colon is. I do believe when you're looking at the rectum and the uh, sigmoid colon, sagittal views are critical all the time, but especially critical. You can see the IMA flow and the prominent vascular flow with active bleeding in the patient's lower rectum.
beautifully shown as we take away bone. One of the things if you're doing MIP imaging, you want to remove bone to be able to see in detail all the vessels. And that's shown very nicely in this case. And I could give it a negative display. So again, learning how to use 3D imaging, make sure you, the radiologist, know how to do it, not just your technologist. Rectal varices are the most common seen a finding in the setting of cirrhosis and portal hypertension, up to three quarters of patients. We often see rectal varices, but that doesn't mean rectal varices will bleed. And it's a small percent that actually bleeds, but when they bleed, it can be significant. Large serpiginous veins can be seen both surrounding the rectum and within the rectal wall itself on portal phase imaging. One thing to remember, rectal varices usually show better on venous than arterial phase imaging. Though sometimes you will see them and on later phase imaging, they wash away. Look at the size on arterial phase imaging of the rectal varices. And no surprise, the patient had GI bleeding and this is the cause, right? Very, very nicely shown in this example. And here I'll just take you through and scroll downwards you're looking at the sigmoid colon, not as impressive, descending colon, not that impressive. But as you scan down to the lower rectum, there's some stool in the colon. But as you scan low enough, all of a sudden you begin to see the prominent vessels feeding the patient's rectum. And you see the large rectal varices present. In this case, the varices are greater on the right side than the left side. My experience is when the vessels are much larger on one side, those are the cases where typically you will have bleeding uh, present and the bleeding will be due to the varices. And here's that same data set in a coronal view. Again, scrolling carefully through data sets, using multiplanar, using MIP imaging, so 2D and 3D, all become very valuable in these cases. And again, you can see the bleeding here from the varices, particularly well shown on the MIP imaging. So again, look how nicely it shows the feeding vessels. And rectal varices is something you need to look at very carefully. And again, the importance of scanning low enough. Again, this patient's liver does not look too bad. As we said, when you have really impressive cirrhosis, rectal varices are there in the majority of cases. And here's just another look at the extent of the varices present. Patients with portal hypertension, rectal varices occur, occur up to three quarters of cases. But again, as I told you, significant bleeding is less than 5%. So I think one of the challenges we have is sometimes you see very prominent varices. I'll describe them. I may say, particularly when they're impressive, if the patient has GI bleeding, this can be a source of GI bleeding. But remember, 95% of patients with rectal varices will not have GI bleeding. Now, another case, patient had the GI bleeding, a patient had a history of lymphoma. Just like in the stomach, when you see high density in bowel, you got to be thinking about the possibility of bleeding. As you look carefully here on the arterial imaging, Look at these bright lines coming through. To me, that's highly suspicious of bleeding. You can see on the MIP imaging, it's especially well seen. And then as we go through the range of images, the high density of the fluid consistent with bleeding, the small prominent vessels consistent with bleeding. And then here's another example with rectal bleeding on the right side of the patient's colon. Again, bleeding is often asymmetric. You can see it very nicely layering out on the sagittal views in the rectum as well. And as you go from arterial to venous phase imaging, the bleeding in the right wall of the colon, a flat lesion was present, increases between arterial and venous phase imaging. Interestingly, there are certain rules as things go from arterial to venous. Uh, those bleeds are the ones that persist the most. And that statement is true in stomach, small bowel, and in the patient's colon. Very nicely shown. And again, here's some coronal views showing the active site of bleeding as well. Again, look carefully at all of the images. So here it's right-sided bleeding present. Now, when you look and go back to that article by Marty I mentioned before, talking about 98% accuracy, that indeed is very impressive. Surely more than a decade ago, 
I think was surely in the high 90% range. Again, the challenge of proving whether you're right or wrong is always the fact that bleeding can stop. And if you do a study now and it's negative and you scan again in a half hour and it's positive, it doesn't mean you miss the bleed. It means that bleeding can stop on its own and recur. And that's always going to be the challenge of defining the exact accuracy of CT or angio or anything else for GI bleeding. In this article by Shilka, the high negative predictive value of CTA for the evaluation of GI bleeding suggests its utility for excluding patients that are unlikely to benefit from classic angiography, and that indeed is the case. CTA is negative. We do not do angiography. The rate of detection of bleeding source and colonoscopy was higher when the CT was positive, and now often people will consider putting off doing colonoscopy if the CT is negative. Again, almost four times as many patients will have a positive colonoscopy when the CT is positive compared to when the CT is negative. So not only does it help guide classic angio, but also classic colonoscopy. So concluding then, CTA is the gold standard for detecting the source of GI bleeding. And really, it's a way of triaging the patient, whether the source is the stomach, the small bowel, or the colon, it's ideal. Detection and extent of bleeding, determining the cause of bleeding are all possible. Again, the importance of protocols, fast injection rates, dual phase imaging, and also looking beyond the axial images to coronal and sagittal and 3D imaging becomes very valuable. So I think hopefully I've shown you lots of good cases. There's many more cases on the CTSS teaching file. Get a good look at lots of cases so you really understand how to recognize even the most subtle of bleeds, and I'll think you'll do a great job. And with that, have a great day. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.